Well, thank you, Dr. Laughlin, and, and I thank the uh, Journal of Experimental Physiology for asking me to give this talk. Now, Dr. Payton uh, was a physician who trained heavily in the basic sciences in biochemistry and physiology. So today we would call him a, a physician scientist. And he had an insatiable appetite for research because he did everything from studying bins and the uh, treatment of bins during the Second World War to animal models and, and, and also looking at the neuromuscular blockers in, in tissue models. Now, he was chairman of pharmacology at Oxford and he was the honorary director of the Wellcome Institute for the History of Medicine. And there he became also very interested in ideas and where they came from and then this lecture is, is named after him. Something you might enjoy reading is his paper on becoming and being a pharmacologist, which was published in about uh, 1986. And it would have made a wonderful patent lecture because it kind of gives the history of the beginnings of, of pharmacology. Now, Professor Payton was knighted in 1979 at the age of 62. He also apparently was kind of a man about town. This shows him with a queen mother at a gala in London in the, in, in near the end of his career. I wish integrative biologists got that much respect in the U.S. as they do in the, in the U.K. Now, uh, on a more serious note, I would uh, like to dedicate this lecture to Dr. Uh, Jeff Potts. Uh, he was an enthusiastic, hard-working, bright, young scientist who died of cancer at the age of 51. He, had, he trained and worked with people on both sides of the pond, and he was certainly on the ascending uh, uh, limb of his re re productive career when he, when he died. Dr. Potts did his PhD at the University of North Texas with Peter, Peter Raven. He then went to work at Johns Hopkins with Art Sugas and finished up a postdoc there and then joined me in Dallas to finish his postdoc and become a, a young faculty member. In England, he worked with Mike Spires and Julian Payton. He had a, he had a mini sabbatical over here, and he and Julian stayed close friends and close collaborators uh, until, until, he, until he died. Now, the, during exercise, the cardiovascular response is rapidly and adequately adapted to the intensity of the exercise. Now, how this precise matching of the cardiovascular response to the intensity of exercise occurs has uh, intrigued physiologists from, for over 100 years. And this shows here Professor Johan Johansson, who was from the Karolinska. He got his medical degree in 1889 and his PhD in 1990 from Uppsala. And he became very interested in this regulation of the circulation and also the respiration during, during exercise. So in, in uh, 1893, uh, he, he published a paper, uh, and, and it roughly translates the effect of muscle activity on ventilation and heart function. And in this study, he utilized both uh, uh, d dogs and rabbits to study the early, early responses of the cardiovascular system to exercise. And the study that he did on rabbits is shown in this uh, in next slides. In this, the left side is the heart rate data, and the right side is the mean blood pressure data. And he did two things. He had the rabbits lightly anesthetized, and they were at rest, or exercise or passive movements. And how he did the experiment was he would pull on the rabbit's leg. If the rabbit then would contract his leg, he called it exercise. Exercise. If he pulled on the leg and didn't cause a, 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 a contraction of the muscle, he called that passive stretch. And you see here that with, with exercise, going from rest to exercise, there's a marked increase in the heart rate. There's also a marked increase in the blood pressure shown over here. If he only passively moved the leg, we see here that with exercise, I mean, with, with 
passive movement, there was also was an increase in heart rate, which was much less, and an increase in blood pressure, which was much, much less. So from this study, he hypothesized that there was a central mechanism causing cardiovascular changes, but there's also a reflex mechanism coming back from the muscle. In other words, during, during exercise, the central mechanism is that when you decide in the brain to exercise, it sends both a muscle, a, 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 a signal to the, to the muscle to exercise, but in a parallel fashion, it sends a signal to the cardiovascular center to change the heart rate, to increase the heart rate and increase the blood pressure. In the peripheral control mechanism, the brain causes the muscle to exercise, but then there's a feedback mechanism from the muscle through the cardiovascular centers to cause the changes in heart rate and blood pressure. Now, in, in his studies, this mechanism in the muscle must have been a mechanoreceptor because it was happening very rapidly and wasn't any time for any chemical changes to occur. Now, the central mechanism here was studied by Krogh and Linhard uh, in, human, in human subjects. And Dr. Krogh was a brilliant innovator and investigator. He was a professor in Copenhagen. He studied both animals and human exercise physiology. In fact, he was maybe known well also in his work on comparative uh, physiology. Now, in, in 1920, Dr. Krogh won the Nobel Prize for the discovery of the capillary motor regulating system. And what he showed was that during exercise, when a muscle begins to contract, there's a recruitment of capillaries so that the muscle has more capillaries to transmit oxygen to the exercising muscle. Now, his uh, co colleague was Professor Johannes Lindhorn. They lived about the same period of time. Uh, they stayed active in research together for their entire lives. Now, Lindhard was also a very talented and rigorous scientist, and he mainly studied the cardio cardiorespiratory responses to stress, and the stresses that he studied were cold and also the stress of exercise. And he perfected a foreign gas method uh, to study the cardiac output, and he studied cardiac output during various environmental stresses and during the stress of exercise, and the numbers that he obtained back in those early days, well, pretty early days, were the same as we find with more uh, techniques, uh, with, with more uh, rigorous techniques uh, today. Now, these two men combined to publish a paper in, uh, in, in 1913, and the title of the paper was The Regulation of Respiration and Circulation During the Initial Stages of Muscular Work. And in this paper, they looked at the central mechanism and whether you could find that in man. Now, in that paper, they show this table, and they give the credit to the table to a Miss Buchanan. And in that, they uh, thank her for this, and this is her data obtained in Oxford. And Miss Buchanan obtained this data on a it's described as a tricycle, and she was one of the early people to be able to record the electrocardiogram in people who were <laughs> physically active. Now, Miss Buchanan's data is shown here. It's very interesting that uh, <coughs> they utilized <coughs> three subjects on the graph that I'll show you next. This subject, this subject, and this subject. And I'm pretty sure that this CGD is CG Douglas. And Douglas was a very famous uh, respiratory physiologist at the University of Oxford, and he's n well known even today for the Douglas bag, which is still used in, in respiratory physiology and in exercise uh, uh, phys physiology. So when uh, they plotted this data, and it's nice that uh, C.G. Douglas made the cut, his data is on this slide shown right here, he wasn't in the best of shape, as you can see, he didn't get very high heart rates or didn't work very hard. But it shows here that there, with the initiation of exercise, there's an immediate increase in the heart rate. Back in Copenhagen, uh, they studied another subject, but they could only count his heart rate by his pulse, and they had another, none of the really early data. So this early data was really uh, uh, given to them by, by, uh, by um, uh, Ms. Buchanan. And they stated from this that the heart rate increased the first beat after starting exercise. 
when you start exercise, the first beat of your heart increases. Now, I'd like to say a little bit more about Miss Buchanan, whose name was Florence Buchanan, and she had one important mentor. Well, she had several mentors, but one very well-known mentor, and that's Sir John Scott Burden Sanderson. Now, this is the bust of him in the, uh, uh, in the Oxford University Museum. Now, he had a medical degree from Edinburgh. Then he was, got very interested in physiology, and he was a Jordrell Professor of Physiology at the University College London, and he also was the first occupant of the Wayne Fleet Chair of Physiology at Oxford University. In 1895, he became the holder of the prestigious Regis Professor of Medicine in Oxford. That was in 1895. In 1896, he recruited Florence Buchanan from University College London to be his private research assistant in Oxford. Now, at the time, Florence Buchanan had a Bachelor of Science degree and was 29 years old. And she worked with him for eight years until he retired from the chair in 1904, and then he died uh, one, one year after that. Now, one of the things that Burden Sanderson was well known for is his pioneer work in electrophysiological studies of both contracting skeletal muscle and contracting cardiac muscle, or early, an early person in the field of electrocardiography. Now, the paper that's quoted in Krogh and Linhard, from where that table came, is this paper right here called The Physiological Significance of the Pulse Rate by Florence Buchanan. And then I'll talk about this in a minute. She had a doctorate of science. And this was published in the Transactions of the Oxford University Scientific Club in 1909. And this publication is no longer with us. But these this paper, there's only two copies that I could find in the world of this paper. One was in the Oxford University Museum Library, and the other was in the Wooster College Library in Oxford. And they were kind enough to reprint this paper for me and send it to me. And it's, uh, this, is a, this is a page uh, from, from that paper. The, the page I got was very brown and very old, but this was just a reproduction of that. Now, Florence Buchanan was also interested in, in the electrophysiology of skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle. She was an outstanding investigator in her own right and published many single author papers in the Journal of Physiology and the Proceedings of the Royal Society of Medicine. Her studies included the pulse rate in humans as related to the heart size. In fact, she was one of the early ones to suggest that athletes had large hearts and slow heart rates at rest. She also studied the heart rates of hibernating animals, both when they were hibernating and when they weren't, and, and many other sem seminal studies. She published one paper in the Journal of Physiology, which was 66 pages long. I would like to see uh, uh, David's expression today if he got a paper from 66 pages to, to publish in his journal. Now, she was the first woman to attend the Physiological Society meeting in 1896, which was a year after she moved to, to Oxford. But she was not a member, but, so she couldn't attend dinner. She could go to the meeting, but she couldn't attend dinner. Now, Florence Buchanan received her Doctor of Science degrees from University College London in 1901. Even though the work was all done in Oxford, Oxford was not giving defaults to women till I'm not sure when, in the 1920s. That's a very deep uh, kept secret exactly what year it was that Oxford gave a, a defield to, to, a, to a woman. But the University College London gave its first DSC to a woman in 1884. Now, it's very interesting to study uh, the uh, women physiologists uh, in the early uh, days of the Physiological Society. Now, this is a book that was published, uh, Women Physiologists and an Anniversary Celebration of Their Contributions to British Physiology. And I think if you haven't read this book, it's, it's a nice book to peruse and look at some of the things about it. It discusses women scientists in physiology in, in England and the barriers they faced, including becoming a member of the Physiological Society. Now, 
the, the debate to admit women to the Physiological Society started in 1913. And John Scott Haldane proposed that a woman should be admitted. And actually, he sponsored Florence Buchanan to be the first women member, woman member of the Physiological Society. Uh, uh, William Bayless, brother of, the brother of Ernst Henry Starling, opposed this. And Starling, I mean, supported the proposal. But Ernest Henry Starling, the man of the law of the heart and the law of the capillaries, one of the most famous cardiovascular physiologists there ever has been, opposed the proposal. He stated that the organization was principally, quote, a dining society, and it would be improper to dine with ladies smelling of dog. Then he said it would actually be the men smelling of dog. So the opponents prevailed for two years, and the first woman was not admitted into the Physiological Society until January 1915. And at that time, six women were admitted. And you see Florence Buchanan here. Uh, these are alphabetical, but at the top of the list. At the time that she became a member of the Physiological Society, she had already uh, published two papers in the Journal of Physiology, and she had given 10 oral communications at, at the meeting of the Journal of Physiology. So she could go, she could talk, but she uh, uh, was not allowed to have dinner with the men smelling of dog. Now, I was not able to find a picture of Florence Buchanan, but it's amazing what you can find on Google. Somebody had taken a picture of her tombstone, and she is buried in Oxford at the Wolvercote Cemetery. Now, she was in Oxford from the year she went there in, 19, in 1896 to her death in 1931. So for 35 years, she worked in the University Laboratory of Physiology uh, in Oxford. So that, that paper, at least uh, there's much more to that paper than just the heart rate response, but I kind of wanted to just talk about that particular part of it. But Krogh and Linhard not only studied the, the central control mechanism, but they also studied in man the, the reflex control mechanism on the initiation of the, of the heart rate response. Now, uh, they published this paper in 1917, a comparison between voluntary and electrically induced muscular work. And at this time, they went back to Oxford and repeated the studies of the data that they had gotten from Miss Buchanan. And they did this on the Krogh bicycle. Dr. Krogh developed a, a technique of bicycling, which had magnets on a disc here of copper with a flywheel that was lead. And this bicycle can be very, very precisely calibrated for the workload that the person is doing in kilogram, kilogram meters. And Dr. Krogh and Linhard both felt that if you were going to study exercise physiology, you needed a, a, a very good mechanism of, of measuring the work that the person was doing. Now, the bicycle, the tradition of using the bicycle is, is, is prevalent still today in, in, in the Scandinavian countries. Many other countries now use treadmills, which, which are much, if you measure the oxygen consumption on the treadmill, you know what the, the workload is, but you cannot precisely determine the workload because of differences in the way the person walks on the treadmill and differences in their weight and such. So they repeated the 1913 studies, and when the, when the subject was on this bicycle, he also had electrodes placed on both of his wrists. And the EKGs were measured with the help of a Professor Louis Seagard Fredericia. And I will, like I said more about Mr. Buchanan later, I will say a little bit more about him later. But when they repeated the studies that they did in Oxford, the top part of this diagram shows the studies that were done in Copenhagen. All three of these studies were done upon uh, uh, Lindhard. He was the subject. And in two of the, one study here and in one study here, they got the same data that they got in the, the, the data that Ms. Buchanan had given them. That is that there was an instant increase in the heart rate at the moment exercise started. <clears throat> 
And uh, uh, so this really then agreed completely with the paper that they published in 1913 on, with Miss Buchanan's data. Now next they wanted to study electrically induced exercise. And I don't know how uh, Krog and Linhard found this paper. It was, a, it was a journal that wasn't very uh, uh, well known. And the title of the paper, from my French translation, is The Cure of Obesity by Electrically Produced Exercise. Now, the, 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 this technique produced exercise by electrically stimulating the muscles. It was very clever and insightful of Krogan and Linhard to use this method to study the peripheral mechanism. In other words, when the exercise was started by stimulation of muscle, there could be no central mechanism. It was purely the uh, reflex mechanism. And they, uh, this paper is titled The Cure of Obesity, but the cure of obesity by this technique was a hoax then, and it's still a hoax today, but you can still buy electro stimulators to take your exercise while you're lying comfortably in bed, but I'm afraid it doesn't cure obesity. Now this device consisted of the subject sitting on a chair with two uh, uh, electrodes here and two electrodes here that served as grounds. And then the subject <coughs> was placed on the chair and stimulating electrodes were put on the front and back of the calf, on the thighs, on the stomach, and on both arms so that they could be stimulated to contract, contract these uh, muscles. And also they had EKG electrodes put on each arm to be able to study the heart rate response when exercise uh, was started. Not only was this not enough, but now they were loaded with 100 kilograms of sandbags. And it was stated that this was done to increase the muscular work and to diminish the violent movements. Um, and so they would put all these sandbags on the, when they to stimulate the person, he would slightly lift off of the table and they were able to exercise in that way. And we're arguing in the States about what the definition of torture is, but I think this could join, we could join, this could join waterboarding as a technique for enhanced inter, inter, interrogation. Now, just a moment to say a, a little bit about Professor Louis Sigurd Fredericia. He got his, <coughs> he, his family immigrated to Denmark in the 1750s, <coughs> and he, they landed and took to, to, to a village in Jutland or Uland, and uh, the name of the town was Fredericia. So they took the name of the town as their last name. He got his medical degree from the University of Copenhagen in 1910, and then he trained with Professor Christian Bohr. And Christian Bohr was the father of Niels Bohr, who won the Nobel Prize for the atom. And uh, in Copenhagen, and also Louis Fredericia uh, studied in Oxford with a George Dreyer and a Francis Gotch, who were both people who had trained with uh, Sanderson. So it really was a lot of incestual relationships going on here between Copenhagen and, and, and Oxford. Now he, he, Dr. Fredericia only published one paper in electrocardiography, but it is recognized as one of the most important early papers because what he studied was the duration of systole on the EKG. And he looked at two things the, that showed that when you increase heart rate, there is a short a slight diminish in the QRS uh, complex time. Most of it is the, is the other interval that it gets much shorter. But he also showed that this was different in normal controls and in patients with heart disease. And that's the only paper he published, but he is recognized in the world's literature of electrophysiology for that one paper. Um, he was also one of the first scientists and is best known for this for his work for his work in, uh, in, in nutrition. Now the EKGs that were taken are shown on this uh, next slide. This is a slide from the tracing of the heart rate and respiration during the response to voluntary the response to uh, stimulated exercise and, 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 and during induced work. And this is a time scale. And this is the pulse rate. <clears throat> 
And this is the, when exercise was started, and this is the increase in ventilation. And you can see it's quite easy to measure the increase in ventilation, but this is, this is an EKG recorded on a smoke drum, which has a very, very low frequency response. And I think what they're seeing here is only ventricular activity, but you are able to count the heart rate for this. I tried myself to blow this tracing up and count it, but it's, it's very difficult, very difficult to do. But the results that they reported are shown on the bottom part of this slide. I think it's very interesting that J.L., Johann Lindhard, was the subject in two of the experiments. It probably was pretty difficult to recruit people to, uh, to volunteer to have this, this experiment done on them. There were no catheters, but you were put in this bed loaded with sandbags, and then, and then your muscles were stimulated. But again, as they see here, that the heart rate increased very rapidly, but it didn't increase, didn't appear to increase as rapidly during induced exercise as it does during voluntary exercise. But they, so they say that the heart rate increased one more beats after starting exercise, and that was an was a, a estimate. But they also said that the heart rate is central in origin in voluntary work and reflex in origin in, in uh, uh, induced work. In other words, when you increase your heart rate with central command, or with, with the central mechanism, it goes directly to the cardiovascular center and the increase in heart rate is faster than when the brain exercises the muscle and it has to be fed back to increase the heart rate. But we got interested several years ago to re-examine this initiation of the heart rate response with voluntary and induced exercise. And the study that we've done was, was, was to re-examine this with, more, uh, with better technology uh, than, than they had to use back in the er, late, early 1900s. And the investigators on this were John Williamson in Dallas, Antonio Nebregra from Brazil, who is shown here as the subject. And this is a tandem bicycle, and the subject always sat in front, whether he was initiating the bicycle ride or whether he was... Be act, whether he was being passively moved by, the, by his partner in the back who would start, would start exercising. Now also there was a trigger shown here that as soon as the wheel moved, it made a mark on the EKG taken from the subject. So the study was done in random order and it was repeated ad nauseum either the person starting the exercise or his partner starting the exercise. And in many of the studies, uh, electromagnetic stimulation was done on the quadriceps to increase the activation of the mechanoreceptors when the person uh, started exercise. And you see here, the, uh, another, he had both an EKG and, and a finopress on. Uh, so the data from that slide is shown here. It shows that if you voluntarily start exercising, and you start exercising in the first third, the middle third, or the last third of an RR interval, no matter where you start the exercise, even if it's in the last third, that QRS, um, that RR interval shortens. So this could happen very, very rapidly. However, if the exercise is started passively with stimulation of the muscle, then if it starts in the first third of the RR interval, that RR interval shortens. But if it starts in the middle third or the last third of the RR interval, that doesn't shorten, but the next beat shortens. So you can get a pretty, pretty rapid increase in the heart rate uh, from this, but it's not as fast as you can get from, from central command. Now, this is a later picture of Krogan and Lindhard. These two men were able to, to work together for their entire scientific careers. And that's rare that one doesn't have an ego that wants to take all the credit. We have a very good example of two men working together in Dallas. Mike Brown and Joe Goldstein have been working together since they were residents at Mass General Hospital in Boston, came to Dallas and are still working today, and they won the Nobel Prize in the, in the 18, 1980s, 88 about, for the HDL receptor. So it's nice when people can continue to work closely together and not let their egos get in the way. Now, these two men established a very strong tradition of studying the integrative biology of exercise in human subjects. 
So they had continued to maintain the Stockholm-Copenhagen axis as sort of the holy land of the integrative biology of exercise. Now these two men trained three other men who were called the Three Musketeers, and those were Erling Asmussen, Maurice Nielsen, and Eric Hoovey Christensen. And they continued this tradition, these three men. They worked under, they, they worked during the occupation in the Second World War, but they continued studying exercise physiology under those circumstances. Then Eric Hoovey Christensen was the ment one of the main mentors for Bing Saltine, who now carries on that same tradition. And if you went to the symposium this morning, you'll see how active they still are in studying human exercise physiology. Now the next question was, we know that there is a reflex for muscle that can be activated by mechanoreceptors. But the question was, is there any uh, chemical changes in the muscle that might be able to also reflexly uh, regulate the, uh, ca the cardiovascular system during exercise? And this question was answered by Alan Smirk. Now, Dr. Smirk was born in England got his uh, medical degree in 1927. He then was a research assistant at the University College London for several, several years. And then when he got ready to get an academic appointment, times were tough at that time, like one of the previous times that times were tough. And he had, it was difficult to get an academic position. So he went to greener pastures and then from 1935 to 1940, he was in Egypt. And in Egypt, he was the professor of pharmacology and a physician at the Egyptian University in Cairo. And this is when he studied uh, his exercise physiology. He was only there for uh, five years, but published some very interesting papers. And he was also, in 1940, after the five years in Egypt, he went back to New Zealand and became a pioneer in, in the drug treatment of hypertension. And he was knighted in New Zealand in 1958. So there's a lot of similarity between Dr. Smirk, Sir Smirk, and Sir Payton. They both lived in the 1900s. They both were physicians, both pharmacologists, both researchers in hypertension, and both knighted. However, I, I couldn't find a picture of a uh, Sir, Sir Horace Smirk escorting the, the Queen Mother. So he, that was the one difference between the two men. Now, he, had a, he published a paper with Allen. I, also, I wish I could tell you more about M. Allen, but he sort of disappears from the literature, and I couldn't, I couldn't precisely see where he went after these studies. He, I think, was in Egypt and stayed in Egypt, and he was worked, and his work with Smirk was apparently the only research work that he did in this, in this area. So in this paper, they did a very, very simple experiment. They took the blood pressure in the left arm, and they had the man, the subject, squeeze a rubber bulb at one per second with his right hand. And then they put a cuff around here, they would do the study first, squeezing the bulb and taking the blood pressure with this uninflated, and that was their control study. Then they would blow this up to above systolic pressure, have them squeeze again, and that was the ischemic study. And the results of that study are shown on this slide right here. The upper is the control study, and we show you here exercise in red and recovery in green. You see that during exercise, there's an increase in systolic blood pressure. When the exercise stops the re during recovery, the systolic blood pressure falls back down. However, when you put the ischemic cuff on before you start exercise, there's a marked increase in the blood pressure response to exercise. But more importantly, when you stop exercise, as long as the cuff is left on, the blood the Systolic blood pressure stays high and even may rise higher until the cuff is released and then the, then the blood pressure falls. So they concluded from this that during exercise there's a substance produced in the muscle that reflexly activates the cardiovascular system to cause what they call the blood pressure raising reflex. 
But they also had a second paper on observations in man on a pulse accelerator reflex from the voluntary muscles of the leg. And how that experiment's done is shown in this slide. The subject had his heels on the floor, a 12 kilogram weight put on his knees, cuffs put around his thighs, and in the left arm, the blood pressure was taken or the heart rate was taken uh, just by counting the pulse. So these are very simply designed experiments that don't take much equipment, but they were very cleverly done, I think. And so they would do the study first with just raising the heels with these not inflated. Then they would inflate these and repeat the study. And the, da the data from this kind of study is shown on this slide. Now, instead of blood pressure, we have pulse rate along here. And again, the exercise in red, recovery is in green. And we see when you start raising your heels against that 12 kilogram weight, you get a modest but, t but definite 10 to 15 beat increase in heart rate. And as soon as you stop exercising, the heart rate comes back down. However, before you start raising your heels, the cuffs are blown up in both legs, causing ischemia. Then you see that there's an increase in heart rate like there was before. But as long as the cuff's on, the heart rate stays elevated until the cuff is let down and then the heart rate returns. So they said then that these, the chemicals produced in, in muscle would not only increase the blood pressure, but would also increase the, the heart rate. But they wanted to compare these two, that is the blood pressure and heart rate response to just exercising one forearm to the response where you're exercising two calves. In other words, the muscle mass being exercised is much greater here than the muscle mass is here. And what did they find in, uh, in, in uh, this kind of experiment? Well, this shows above the systolic pressure. And whether you are including two legs and looking at the ischemic response afterwards with the cuff on, or just one hand, the blood pressure response is very similar. So the blood pressure response does not appear to be very muscle mass dependent. However, the heart rate raising reflex only occurs when a you're using a large muscle mass, shown here, with the occlusion in two leg muscles and with just hand grip, one does not see the heart rate stay up during the, the post-exercise occlusion. So one is very muscle mass dependent and the other one is not. Now the third study in that series is shown here. And the title of this one is The Unilateral Loss of Blood Pressure Raising Pulse Accelerating Reflex from Voluntary Muscles Due to a Lesion in the Spinal Cord. This was a young Egyptian person, about, well, not, about 40 years old, who had numbness in one leg from above the knee to his toe. Now, they didn't have fancy MRIs or fancy T CT scans. All they could do was, an, was a neurological exam. And they noticed that there was the, the cold presser test in this insensitive leg. There wasn't one. No blood pressure rise. We put the insensitive leg in cold water. And also the good leg appeared to be slightly weaker than the insensitive leg. Now, this was not a true brown C cord lesion with marked weakness on one side and lack of feeling on the other side because of a hemisection of the spinal cord. But it was, in a way, a brown C cord equivalent. So they studied this one subject. And what they would do is exercise the good leg of heel raises with ischemia and also do the insensitive leg with, with ischemia, with the, with the heel raising reflex. So this time we were looking at ischemic responses both times. When they exercised the normal or leg that had sensation but may have been slightly weak, they saw a nice increase in blood pressure shown here. And with the cuff ischemia, the blood pressure stayed on until they dropped the cuff, they inflated, deflated the cuff, and now the blood pressure came back down. However, on the other side, the leg that had no feeling, when they put the cuff on and did the exercise, as soon as they stopped exercising, the blood pressure came back down. In other words, the, the, the chemicals in the muscle 
which had kept the blood pressure up here did not keep the blood pressure up here. The chemicals were probably there, but they weren't being uh, conducted to the cardiovascular, cardiovascular area. So this, the, without the afferent input, they could not uh, get this response. Well, um, those were very interesting studies. And in 1943, Julius Comro and, and, and Carl Schmidt, who were, uh, I guess you would call them in our, they were sort of uh, cardiorespiratory physiologists because Dr. Comro was a, a, a great uh, physiologist, but he also was head of the Cardiovascular Research Institute in San Francisco and did studies also in, uh, in um, the cardiovascular area, but he was mainly interested in the hyperpnea of exercise and was there a component coming from the muscle. And so to, to look at that, they repeated the, the uh, uh, elements work studies and they did find that during post-exercise ischemia, the ventilation stayed up until they reduced the, uh, the deflated the cuff. However, they did not find any changes in blood pressure, so they were not able to repeat the cardiovascular changes that uh, Alan and Smirk had seen. But since that time, many, many investigators have confirmed that Alan and Smirk were correct and that there is this blood pressure raising reflex. But also, Comro and Schmidt uh, studied what they call the Alan and Smirk type in animals. And to do this, they use a method described in Sherrington's uh, Oxford Student Laboratory Manual, where they went in and did a laminectomy and stimulated L7 and S1 to get the tricep sewer to contract. When they did that stimulation, they found no increase in blood pressure during the simulated exercise. Now, 30 years, 20 years later, Fred Kao in 1963 found using the same technique that there was blood pressure changes and then Dr. Coote in 1971 along with uh, 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 Dr. Hilton and Perez Gonzalez clearly showed that there was a pressure reflex in the cat and McCloskey and I in 1972 again confirmed that. So since then the pressure reflex done by similar technique to this has been shown in the dog, the cat, the chicken, and also in the rat. So why couldn't Comro and Schmidt get a press response? Well, some of the problems with the Comro and Schmidt study were that they, the anesthesia they were using was somewhat different. They used morphine in some of their experiments. They also stimulated the ventrules at 4 hertz, and all the subsequent people have used anywhere from 20 to 50 hertz to get the, to get the press response. And also the tricep a muscle just contracted. It didn't develop any tension and it didn't shorten against any load, so it wasn't doing any work. For, so for those reasons, I think that that's why the, uh, they didn't find the uh, cardiovascular uh, responses. So, uh, way back, they had something they, they said was a central mechanism, and that's commonly called today central command. And there's also a peripheral mechanism, which today is commonly called the exercise pressure reflex. But since those early studies, we have uh, tried to understand what is the role of the arterial barrel reflex during, during exercise. Now, that reflex has been known for more than 100 years. And as you know, when the uh, pressure goes up in the aortic arch and in the carotid sinuses, the increased blood pressure activates receptors, which reflexly cause a depression in heart rate and a depression in sympathetic nerve activity. But during exercise, there's an increase in blood pressure and an increase in heart rate and an increase in sympathetic nerve activity. So where are the baroreceptors? Well, the easiest first explanation was that they were turned off during exercise. They just weren't doing anything. Then later on, it was said that they had changed their sensitivity. But today, the, the sort of present concept is that the arterial barrel reflex is reset during exercise. And what do, we, what do we mean by that? Well, it shows here the plot of blood pressure against heart rate or sympathetic nerve activity. 
And this is the resetting that occurs with arterial baroreceptors during exercise. Now, the yellow line is the arterial baroreflex function curve during rest. And you see clearly here, if blood pressure, uh, uh, if, if blood pressure goes up this way, heart rate goes down. If blood pressure goes up, heart rate goes down. So it's, it's, it's working at rest. Then during exercise, it appears that the curve shifts upward and to the right. So it's again still where the slope of the curve is the same, so it's still working and regulating the heart rate just as it does at rest, but at a much higher operating point. So there's been a shift of this curve upward and to the right. And also experiments have shown that this shift can occur both by a central command, and that's been shown in both humans and animals, and also this shift can occur because of the exercise presser reflex. And that's been shown in also in both man and animals. So in this lecture, I have mainly discussed some of the historical experiments which led to the early insights on the neural control of the circulation during exercise. The early, the early investigators included Johann Johansson, August Crow, Johannes Lindhard, and Harsh Mark. Two other investigators, however, should be mentioned for their contributions, and that's Florence Buchanan and Luis Fredericia. Now, since those early studies, we've learned much more about the neural mechanism that is responsible for the rapid and appropriate matching of the cardiovascular response to the exercise. And we know that the autonomic nervous system plays an important role in that matching. In other words, during exercise, there's withdrawal of the parasympathetic activation to the heart, and there's also activation of the sympathetic nerves, not only to the heart, but the resistance vessels, the capacitance vessels, and to the adrenal medulla. And it would appear that all of these autonomic changes are occurring because of inputs from central command, the exercise pressor reflex, and the arterial barrel reflex. Now, this is supposed to be a historical lecture, so I'm not going into what the current concepts are, but last year in Oxford, at the same time, there was a symposium held on these concepts, and papers were presented there. This was organized by Peter Raven and David Patterson, and they were presented at Oxford last July, and then they were published in Experimental Physiology in January of 1912. And the papers there are on animals for central command, or by Kanji Matsukawa from Japan and David Patterson from Oxford. The exercise pressure reflex in animals was discussed by Mark Kaufman and in humans by Neil Secker. And then the arterial barrel reflex function, the latest ideas on it, were presented by Paul Fidel and Peter Raven. So thank you very much. <laughs>